Let's see. Comic Con badges. <laughs> Star Trek merch. Oh, garden gnomes. <laughs> Race registrations. Chicken harness with leash. I stand by these purchases, particularly my Klingon Bird of Prey 9 inch model warship. And looking at them as a whole can be important if I want to understand what's going on with my money in general. That's why I keep them all in my trusty receipt shoebox, patent pending. But as it turns out, what's going on in my receipt shoebox, patent pending, is important to the entire economy too. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall Macroeconomics. Of course, it isn't only my receipt shoebox that matters to economists. It's the total spending of all members of an economy. The macro receipt shoebox, not just the matro, if you will. And the first step to understanding the total spending in an economy is to take apart who's doing that spending in the first place. And the answer is everyone which is why the eBay bidding war for my Klingon Bird of Prey was so vicious. You might remember from our circular flow model of the economy that firms produce goods and services with the resources they get from households like land, labor, and capital. And in a perfect world, all those goods and services are bought right back up, both by households as well as other firms, the government, or even other countries. The money spent on household consumption, investments by firms on stuff like factories and technologies, government purchases, and net exports adds up to be an economy's aggregate real expenditures, which is just some fancy vocab for the total amount an economy is gonna spend on stuff. In a perfect world, an economy's aggregate real expenditures will look exactly like its GDP, which is our go-to measure of aggregate production. That's because in a perfect world, everything that's being produced is bought up. And while you may calculate your total expenditures by adding up all those crumpled receipts from the bottom of your tote bag, because I know not everyone is organized enough to have their very own receipt shoebox patent pending, Economists calculate aggregate expenditures as the sum of C plus I plus G plus NX, just like GDP. And all that's a hint about why aggregate expenditures are so important. While the consumption, investment, government expenditures, and net exports in our GDP equation represent the total value of all the stuff produced in an economy in a given chunk of time, the same variables in our aggregate expenditures equation represent the value of all the stuff demanded. When everything's working well and the economy is healthy, supply and demand are balanced in long-run equilibrium. So when something changes in aggregate expenditures, it can knock our long-run equilibrium off kilter, which can mean big things for the economy. Now, nobody spends exactly the same way all the time. I don't buy the same array of con badges, running shoes, and model starship figurines every month or even every year. You gotta shake it up and add a Romulan Warbird to my collection every once in a while. As individuals, our spending changes constantly. Like snowflakes, no two credit card bills are exactly alike. But one thing that's going to really influence how we spend is price. According to the law of demand, I'm going to consume more when stuff is cheaper. And the graphic representation of the relationship between price and expenditures across the whole economy is known as our aggregate demand curve. In the graph of our aggregate demand curve, we have price on the y-axis and real GDP on the x-axis. Like many other demand curves, it slopes downward, since quantity demanded decreases as price level goes up. And remember, this isn't the price of a single good, such as Klingon birds of prey, like on the basic demand curve. It's price level across the whole economy. That means our aggregate demand curve shows how real expenditures will respond to rising or falling price levels, thanks to something like inflation. When it comes to my own spending, price is definitely gonna play a big role. But I also think about my purchases based on interest rates and personal finance factors like my disposable income, as well as my expectations about my future income and the economy as a whole all of which can shift the entire aggregate demand curve and tip off economists that we might be shifting away from potential GDP equilibrium. Take everyone's favorite fictional nation, Genovia. 
Nestled snugly between France and Italy, Genovia's pear and olive oil economy may be simpler than most real countries, but its aggregate expenditure still shifts in response to the changes in the market. Take household purchases, or the consumption part of our aggregate expenditure equation. If Genovians have more disposable income, they're gonna spend more too, shifting our aggregate demand curve to the right. Whereas less money in Genovian pockets means less spent in the Genovian economy, and a left shifting aggregate demand curve. So a change in household spending is a sign that something's going on to shift the amount of money Genovians are bringing home. Like maybe Queen Clarice and Princess Mia raised taxes to help collect money for a new orphanage. For the purposes of this example, we're looking at Genovia as a pure monarchy with Julie Andrews as the benevolent dictator. An increase in taxes means each individual Genovian takes home less of their paycheck so they might cut back on their spending, all other things being equal. But when Clarice and Mia issue stimulus checks to their people, there might be more household spending as people have more disposable income. Households might also change their spending based on how confident they are about the economy as a whole, including things like future prices, the availability of goods, and their own future income. If Genovians are feeling super great about the economy that Queen Clarice has built, they'll probably feel more comfortable balling out on crystal-plated pears and gold-flaked olive oil now, and our demand curve will move to the right. But if they think Anne Hathaway is gonna make a horrible queen and lead the economy into a ton of inflation or the job losses that come along with a recession, they might hold off and tighten their belts instead, decreasing aggregate real expenditures and shifting the aggregate demand curve left. Finally, interest rates also tend to affect consumption. If the Genovian central bank raises interest rates, people will likely hold off on big purchases that require loans. Spending will decrease at all possible price points, and the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left. But if interest rates fall, there's less incentive to save, and so people are more likely to spend big on palm fruits and liquid olive fat, or, you know, whatever else the Genovian franc can buy. All this to say, a change in household consumption isn't just a change in household consumption. It's very likely tied to some other economic indicator, which means it's probably a sign of some larger shock to the economy as a whole. But even in economies where consumption is a huge part of the aggregate expenditures, it can't tell the whole story. To get an even clearer idea of a country's aggregate spending habits, the other changes they can indicate, and what that means for our aggregate expenditures GDP equilibrium, we've also got to look at those other letters in our aggregate expenditure soup. Business investment spending is also really sensitive to changes in interest rates and future economic expectations. And changes in firm spending is another thing that can shift the aggregate demand curve right or left. If interest rates are low and economic prospects are rosy, an olive oil company is more likely to spend big on a new factory, moving that aggregate demand curve to the right. But just like with households, higher interest rates or economic uncertainty might slow businesses' spending. In fact, the investment portion of aggregate expenditures is one of the most sensitive to the economic climate and can be a sign that a recession is on the horizon. Government spending is also tied to future expectations as a way to influence the economy through fiscal policy. If Queen Clarice sees those businesses slowing their investment, she might up government spending on things like infrastructure projects to counteract it and avoid a recession. This is gonna increase aggregate real expenditures and shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. Finally, net exports, or the total amount of pears and olive oil Genovia sells to other countries, minus the stuff they import, can be nudged up or down by price, uh, exchange rates, as well as international preferences. Like, maybe Genovian pears go absolutely viral thanks to Princess Mia's TikTok, increasing pear exports internationally and therefore Genovia's aggregate expenditures, shifting the aggregate demand curve to the right. All this to say, these shifts in a country's aggregate expenditures don't exist in a bubble. They're tied closely to other changes in the market, which is why it's so important for me to not only track my spending, but for the economy to track spending as a whole. That way, they can note when something shifts or when spending and production don't quite line up and start thinking of ways to reset the delicate supply-demand balance. Pandemic-era shifts in aggregate expenditures and demand are a real-life example of how let's say wacky, economic circumstances can influence spending and the economy as a whole. In the United States, a very consumption-driven economy, consumer confidence was understandably shaken by the whole deadly contagious virus staying locked in your house vibe. Plus, 
there was a whole bunch of stuff lots of households totally stopped spending on, like restaurant meals, concerts, and travel. Thanks to this reduced household spending, aggregate real expenditure decreased and the aggregate demand curve shifted to the left, meaning people were spending less at any price level. The economy ground to a near halt and spending plummeted compared to its potential. But as pandemic conditions eased, aggregate demand shifted to the right as people emerged from their hidey holes with fistfuls of cash ready to be spent thanks to government stimulus checks and the money they'd save while not spending. This increase in aggregate expenditures was a sign that the economy was recovering in general. When it comes to tracking the spending of an entire economy, our aggregate demand curve can help us see and understand ever fluctuating expenditures. It's easily as helpful as my uh, receipt shoebox, patent pending. And okay, I'll admit it, better organized too. But it's not enough just to draw some lines on a graph or plug some numbers into our aggregate expenditures equation. When we see shifts in our aggregate demand curve or changes in our sum of expenditures, we have to look at the whole economy to figure out what's going on and what to do about it. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment on what you do with your receipts, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.